Good morning, it's Mr. Pete again, your YouTube shop teacher, and I've got a project today. This box just came from McMaster Car, and in it is an 8-inch hand wheel. Beautiful gray iron casting, very reasonably priced at $30 plus postage. I don't know how much that postage is. As you see here on the packing list, it's an iron machinable hub hand wheel, three-spoked dished wheel, 8-inch diameter. This is a beautiful casting, but let's talk about it a little bit. It has about an inch and three-quarter inch hub. Now remember that the hub here, since this is a casting, is slightly tapered. That is, there's pattern draft. It would be difficult to hold this in a three-jaw chuck because it's tapered. Also notice here, this is really probably meant to put a handle on and crank, but I'm going to run it at a higher speed, so I very much would like to get the hole right in the center so that it runs pretty true. I do realize it would be almost impossible to get it to run totally true because it's a, a raw casting and it isn't meant to be run at high speed and it would be out of balance because of this and many other features. But notice here, when they cleaned the casting up, they didn't do a bad job, but it's been ground all the way around and at different depths, so... And there's no flaws at all in that. But here is the problem as I see it. And what I want to do here in this video is to drill and bore this to 5 8 inch as true as possible. I would very much like to put this in the four jaw chuck, but this is an 8 inch chuck and an 8 inch wheel, so that would be a little stretch, and of course I would have to reverse the jaws, but I think the problem here is that the diameter here is, just, is about 1 and 1 16th, and the jaws are about a half inch, so as you can see it wouldn't really grip and it would be very likely to fly out. So I'm leery about using this chuck. Here I have it temporarily as an experiment mounted in the 8 inch 3 jaw chuck. Remember though I'm chucked up on that tapered hub so that would be very precarious and it would be extremely difficult to get it in there so that it runs true although it doesn't look too bad right now. So I really don't want to do this using either one of these chucks that I just showed you. This is an eight and a half inch face plate off of my Atlas lathe and of course this is eight inch so it could be clamped on there and that would cause it to run pretty true but it would be a difficult setup and that would have to be done on the lathe tap one way and another and an indicator used but I think this would be a pretty good method. But I have one more idea. But here's the way I finally decided to do it. On the Bridgeport mill I'm going to clamp it down. I'm going to use the coaxial indicator to bring it on center and then drill it and ream it. Perhaps I'll use the boring bar, I don't know yet. 5 8 is the final size. And now using a center finding head, I have marked it and found the approximate center. This is semi-accurate. And now by using a wiggler, I will bring the machine spindle into alignment with the hub center. Now, for some of you, you might think that that's close enough or that I'm right on dead center, but I'm not. So I'm going to install the coaxial indicator and find what I consider to be a more true position here. So I'm right on the center. The problem with this is that, again, this is a raw, rough casting. I have touched it up a bit with a file, but the feeler point here is going to fluctuate. A little bit as it finds the high and the low spots on the casting. 
A coaxial indicator is a very valuable and accurate instrument. It is not my intention to show you totally how it is used here. It can be used with the machine in motion but at slow speed. But I've already found what I consider to be a pretty accurate center here. So look where the probe is right now and when I rotate it 180 degrees I still have a zero reading. Now let's check it in the Y. There was a little fluctuation there simply because this hub is not truly round. It's only fairly close. So I'm zeroing out the indicator and I'll rotate it again 180 degrees and you can see that I'm right on. So at this point I have zeroed out the digital readout and I will start the machining. And lastly, a 5 8 reamer, slow speed all the way through. Remember, no lubricant required on cast iron. It is self-lubricating. And this is really a high quality casting. And finally, before I take it out, I'm going to take a skim coat here. I'm not sure what the overall dimension of the hub will be yet, so I'm just going to clean it up so it's square. And there it is. I have the wheel mounted on a temporary 5 8 arbor just to see how true it runs because I was really worried about that. And let's take a look at it here. And it runs pretty true. So what I want to do now is to just rough file it before I paint it. I will never get all of these grinding marks out where the parting line was and it really isn't necessary. It could be turned I suppose but I don't think I want to take the time to do that. Well that's it. It's fairly smooth and ready for paint. Well that's it. Looks pretty good. Again ready for a coat of primer and then machine regray. And that's how you go about machining one of these McMaster car rough cast wheels. Now if you're going to put a crank in there you would locate and drill and tap a hole or a press fit for some types of handles. Those are available also in the catalog. You can get these in three spoke and four spoke and many different sizes. You may also find it necessary to broach a key slot, keyway in there, or drill and tap set screw holes depending on your application. Okay that's it. So long for now. I'll see you in the next episode. This is Mr. Pete.